Greetings, unsettled souls. Sam, I beat again you during political commentary with the media speaks. Of course, um, you might know me from Wits News, Blasting News. Uh, speaking of, ah, there you go, uh, Meltdown. Uh, speaking of Wits News, I want to give a shout out not only to Steve Wits, the owner, who has been with me since uh, Facebook did the uh, number on all the conservative journalists and cost me a full-time job. Not only have they been behind us, but if you read a lot of material that is out in uh, in the realm of politics, if you go to Prison Planet, uh, The End of the American Dream, you, you know about a journalist named Michael Snyder. Well, yours truly has just had his newest article, For the Children, uh, published on the most important news.com. They aggregated it, and uh, that's going to increase the readership, I would imagine, quite a bit. So, hello, Bill. Hello, Cindy. Uh, that should increase. So, the, the, uh, the entire network of us that were doing this, that ended up truncated or seeing our searches diminished, sort of are pulling together here, and it's a really nice thing to see. Uh, lastly, before we get into everything, if you would like to donate to the show it, for research time, mailing out dunce caps, uh, which will be next week, um, any of that, uh, you can donate at the correct views at hotmail.com. Donate through PayPal. Uh, any money you give to me goes towards a better show. I would like to get a better camera than this one up top. You guys here on the computer, while well, you're stuck with it. Um, all right, guys, let's get into it. Uh, the LA Times, unless you want to buy a new computer, I'm kidding. Um, the LA Times, I mentioned this for a reason. Southern California earthquake swarm takes an unexpected turn, and there's a reason to worry. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a, another story about uh, California could fall into the ocean one day. That's the quickest way to get people to click off. They've heard it a million times. My point is that the swarming of where this is at, stay with me here. Not only is this a wake-up call to question the use of nuclear power in our country, but it's more of a proof of the intensity and frequency of seismic activity that we're seeing in the Pacific Ocean. And this could matter quite a bit as it pertains to the cleanup at Fukushima, which they think could take 40 years. And for those of you that might just be watching and don't know that I do this every month, um, you could be looking at an extinction event for very large parts of the world in the event that Fukushima was to you know, collapse. Some people have said the whole world. Some people have said the entire northern hemisphere. Some people have gone so far as to, ex to say a global extinction. I don't think it would be that severe. But, I mean, it's worthy of note that since May... 25th, it says here in the LA Times, so it's hardly, you know, a paper you've never heard of. Ranging from a magnitude 0.7 to 3.2, recorded Wednesday at 5.20 p.m. Um, that's according to Caltech staff seismologist Jen Andrews. Three of the quakes have been a magnitude 3 or greater, and uh, that's, of course, the threshold to where you know, it stands out above rather substantially against the regular quake activity, which the world experiences every day. All right, friends, I want to go on a bit here, and I keep getting these ridiculous boneheads. Uh, one bonehead in particular, uh, I, I call him Dr. Gaga, because remember when Radio, uh, Radio Gaga, remember when Lady Gaga went to the radioactive wasteland as the disaster was happening and started saying how safe Fukushima seafood was? It was one of the reasons I began this entire channel, was over her stupidity. So I call this man Dr. Gaga because he is roughly uh, almost as smart as she is questioning the death toll from Fukushima. First of all, the number given, I think, is 3,100, give or take, died due to illness, suicide, and various, you know, injuries from the accident. They don't when you have 3,000 people dead, autopsies were not done on all of them. So how many were due from the original plume of radiation is 
hard to put a number on because people are asking as if the number can be given in total here in 2019 as to what the death toll is from the Fukushima disaster that happened in 2011. Now, I'm going to try to spell out here in language that's so simple that even Dr. Gaga can understand this. Here in, 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 that's going to be a tough one, but we'll go with it. Cancer does not, you don't walk by a nuclear reactor and die of cancer the next day. I mean, you've seen the movie Chernobyl, the miniseries. Yeah, if you get that close to an open reactor where the granite from the reactor is laying on the ground, yes, but that's not the way the death toll is structured. You cannot give a death toll in Chernobyl based on the number of people who died within a year, say, of Chernobyl. You can't do that. Because thousands upon thousands of birth defects, for instance, in Belarus, Belarus, led to a life of misery for people, not only that were children at that time, but particularly those who were uh, parents of those who had been Jews. And you can look up Belarus radiation pictures today. My point is this ties into Fukushima in a very substantial way. Many of the people who had been juiced, maybe they won't die. Maybe they'll just spend a whole lot of time very, really, really sick. Maybe they will die, but they won't die for another 10, 15, 20 years. What is the death toll of Fukushima? Let me try to give you an answer this way. Just to give you some idea, because a lot of this, of course, the Japanese government has wanted to pretend it wasn't due to radiation, but there are ways to test this for people who were in that vicinity at the time. So this is from the nation. Seven years on, sailors exposed to Fukushima radiation seek their day in court. This was dated March 9th, 2018. And I do have new stuff coming up, so don't zone out or leave or anything. I, but I want to get to this because the question keeps coming up. So my answer is the death toll is still happening from Fukushima. Okay, out of those 3,100 people from radiation, I don't know, pick a number, 300, 500, I, who knows, because they didn't test. They just lumped them all into one death. But listen to this, special investigation, U.S. military, I'm reading from the headline now, U.S. military personnel are sick and dying, there's your death toll, dying, and want the nuclear plants designers and owners to take responsibility. Now, unless you think that the radiation in that area only harmed non-Asians, then those in Fukushima would have been exposed to the same amounts of radiation, depending on where the wind was blowing that day. Some may have gotten it worse than the people on Fukushima, and then on board the USS Ronald Reagan. Um, there have been some studies which have said that the USS Ronald Reagan should never have been cleaned and put back into service. It should never be used at all. I'll let you guys argue that out yourselves. But, you know, and we'll get to this later in the show, there is a difference when some things can be cleaned away and some, some elements die naturally. But some of them have a half-life of millions of years, like plutonium or uranium. So depending on what particles were there, you're polishing a turd here when you try to clean this, but we're going to go with it. At over 1,000 feet in length and weighing roughly 100,000 tons, the USS Ronald Reagan, a supercarrier in the United States Navy's 7th Fleet, is not typically thought of as a speedboat. But on March day in 2011, the Nimitz-class ship was hauling ass, according to the petty officer, third-class Lindsay Cooper. Yet when the Reagan got closer to its destination just off the Sendai coast in northeastern Japan, Japan, it slowed considerably. You could hardly see the water, Cooper told me. All you saw was wood, trees, and boats. The ship stopped moving because there was so much debris. Even after more than 20 years of service, Chief Petty Officer Angel Torres said he had never seen anything like it. So he talks about the trucks and the houses uh, that are going by. I want to get to the important part of this for everyone, though. 
The Reagan, along with two dozen other U.S. Navy vessels, were part of Operation Tadachi, which means friends, not Tadashi, which means something else. The $90 million rescue, disaster relief, and humanitarian mobilization to aid Japan in the immediate aftermath of the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. It was treated like a normal alert, Cooper said. You do drills for these scenarios. We went into that mode. She and approximately 3,200 shipmates moved food, water, and clothing from below the flight deck to where it could be put on helicopters and flown to stricken residents. But the mood uh, soon changed. The routine soon changed. All of a sudden, this big cloud engulfs us, Torres said. It wasn't white smoke like you would see from a steam rake, she explained, but it also wasn't like the black smoke that you saw from burning oil fields during the deployment in Kuwait in 1991, during his. It was like something I'd never seen before. Cooper was outside of her room on the flight deck, prepping before the start of the reconnaissance flights. She remembers that it was cold and snowing when she felt out of nowhere a dense gust of warm air. Almost immediately, she said, I felt like my nose was bleeding. But her nose wasn't bleeding. Nor, it says, were there any, was there any blood in her mouth, though Cooper was sure she tasted it. It felt, she said, like I was licking aluminum foil. Okay, so they go on to describe in this article um, exactly what what the Fukushima disaster was. So I'm going to skip that. So we didn't have a chance to take in what we were experiencing, said Torres. It was more like, well, this was different. But when we came off watch, sitting in his office, his perception changed. What the hell just happened? You didn't really know what was going on. But after about 10 minutes, the crew was told to go below deck. It was there that she was first learning about the problems at the Fukushima Daiichi from the television, that Cooper recalls hearing an announcement on the public address system indicating that the ship might have been hit by a plume of radiation from a nearby power plant. Shortly thereafter, Cooper said the mission got hectic and was kind of a crazy mess. Um, they were on the flight deck. They were to implement decontamination, so of course they were exposed to it once again. I was asleep in my rack when I had someone shake the living shit out of me, he said. She, I'm sorry, she said she was told with great urgency that she needed to get to the hangar bay immediately to get a gas mask. As Cooper stood in her pajamas and flip-flops waiting for her mask and filter canisters, she looked around. People were shoving wet rags in the cracks of the hangar bay door so none of the air would seep through. And we had rags stacked up high on the entire wall. That's all they had to protect them. That's what they were sent for. One Marine Corporal, Lance Nathan Pitowski, who arrived several days later on the USS Essex, a WASP-class amphibious assault ship, there seemed to be more some advanced warning, and he had his preparation initially in orderly fashion. So what are these people looking at today? Let me scan forward once again here. They didn't want you coming downstairs too many times because it just took too long. Describing the lengthy and isolating decontamination process that she and her 20 shipmates on the flight deck had gone through. Every time you get close to do humanitarian assist assistance, we'd get, we'd have to dodge another plume. So it's, you know, it's blowing around all over. And again, it's talking about Chernobyl, so we will skip that. We're still trying to get merits, said Attorney John Edwards, the former U.S. Senator and Democratic Vice Presidential nominee, because the merits of the case are so strong. Edwards, along with the attorneys, Kate Edwards' daughter and Charles Bonner, represent what Bonner told were about 400 sailors who accused the Japanese utility of you and the and the U.S. industrial giant of gross negligence in design, construction, maintenance, and operation of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, and of deliberately obscuring the radiological disaster that rapidly unfolded during the March 11th earthquake and tsunami. Now, for those of you that were asking where the proof of the cover-up was, there's part of it right there. 
Needless to say, I wasn't voting for John Edwards, but I can still tell when the man has a point. Let me find some more of this for you. Many of them have had claims um, of being exposed to the snow that fell during that time. Uh, it was radioactive snow. Uh, they, the, the first medical staff tried to uh, whitewash the symptoms which were being brought before them, as it says, stress, was what the Reagan's medical staff told Cooper when she asked about her blurred vision, poor depth perception, and loss of equilibrium during the early days of the mission. Yeah, just stress. Just stress. Like a soldier's never seen stress before. So this one humanitarian effort, that's the stress that did it to you, not the radiation that you were exposed to. Gastroenteritis was what she had, and many of her shipmates were told as a wave of bowel problems swept through the carrier. Yeah, it's just a bug that's going around. It's not the radiation. I had a lot of issues in the restroom, Cooper told me. I don't think I was the only one. People would ship themselves on the flight deck so often that it wasn't even a surprise anymore. Like when you saw someone running from outside the flight deck to go to the decontamination, you knew that something was happening. Torres' experience was comparable. I was in the bathroom constantly, he said. I would eat something, and I would go to the bathroom almost immediately. It happened so often, Torres told me, that he developed severe internal hemorrhoids that eventually required multiple surgeries. So how sick do you have to be? Or is it just the death toll that matters? Does any of this matter? Because I guarantee this happens, and it's happening and happened to the people in Japan who were near this plume. Again, unless you think the plume only affected, you know, U.S. sailors. It was, it was racial, you see. The radiation was kind enough not to poison anybody native to the area, right? Bonehead! When he visited the shipboard, Dr. Torres was told he had diverticulitis, a disease not typically seen in men that young. Watch your diet, don't eat spicy food, and drink lots of water, eat lots of fiber, was the advice he got. They didn't attribute it to anything except it's just going around. But it's been going around a long time. I haven't had a solid bowel movement since. She said she bruises easily and gets burning, tingling sensations in her arm and a rash that extends from her hands to her elbows, an area that coincides to where she'd been up to her sleeves rolled up in the encountered when she encountered the cloud at the start of the Japan mission. Cooper has also recently needed veneers on her teeth, she said, that have started to shatter and break. Oh, but the, you know, there's no health issues from Fukushima, or is it just the death toll? For Pitkowski, the Lance Corporal from Essex, he didn't feel particularly sick until over a year after the operation, Operation Tamadachi, he was uh, back stateside in the fall of 2012 and felt fatigued and had lost weight. And in November of that year, his ankles swelled up to the size of his calves. I'm an in shape and slim guy, and I usually have pretty good definition, he told me. The doctor thought it might be gout, though Piotowski was skeptical. I told him I drink as much as the next 21-year-old, but I don't drink that much. Then on Christmas Day, he lost sight in his left eye. That's when I knew I should probably go to the hospital, he said. In the ER, Piotrowski said the doctors seemed to recognize right away what a blood test and bone marrow biopsy later confirmed. He had leukemia. In a year. In a year. So don't tell me this doesn't affect, doesn't and didn't affect anything. They were honestly surprised I was still walking, he said. Medical staff put him in a gown and rushed him to a bigger hospital. Pietkowski was diagnosed with acute melogeneous leukemia, AML, an aggressive form of blood cancer, most often seen in men over the age of 65. It is rare to see it in an otherwise healthy 21-year-old. He began treatment in Arizona, where he'd been living, but then moved to Chicago to be closer to his parents and what Pietkowski called some pretty amazing doctors. From Christmas of 2012 to Valentine's Day 2014, Piotrowski figures he spent eight months in the hospitals. He went through a year of chemotherapy, but after four months in remission, the leukemia returned. 
He had radiation and stem cell transplant at the start of 2014, which was so far kept him cancer free. But Piotowski is still struggling to rebuild his immune system and battling stiffness and stunning problems. I felt like I'm 60 years old, he said. Petty Officer Perez gave birth to her daughter, Cecilia, in, uh, on March 26, 2011, and it was soon afterward that she told her mom she was feeling ill. She just kept saying her menstrual periods would keep going and going and never stop. Despite her health, she enlisted, re-enlisted at the end of her tour. She was in San Diego trying to sort out some missing paperwork on her enlistment when she was hospitalized for a uterine hemorrhage. According to her mother, she was diagnosed with late-stage ovarian cancer in July of 2016. Mendez wanted her daughter to come back to Texas where she grew up, but Perez refused. She always believed she'd get better. I can't go home, Mendez said. I just re-enlisted. I still owe the Navy two years. On December 7th of 2016, she died. Okay, this goes on and on and on and on in this. The radiation levels at Fukushima were not just significant. I mean... They have devastated the health of people who are very much still living. Again, go, go read the whole article. It's a rather lengthy piece. It's the Navy. But those ones right there completely stand out, I think, the most. The people in this case might be their own decimeters, it said. Um, all the radiation experts interviewed wondered whether the true scale of the radiation doses sustained at the Tetamachi sailors was ever measured. Safety specialist Kalitfen argued that most measurements don't account for what are called hot particles. So when you give me these, this is what the levels were at Fukushima. Doesn't count hot particles. Listen carefully if you have ears. Minute bits, six to nine microns in diameter of intensely radioactive matter that can be extremely dangerous in close proximity or if ingested but are easily missed by measuring devices mere inches away. He also pointed out that different tissues are vulnerable to different isotopes in different ways, and that some parts of, parts of the body are much more sensitive to exposures than others. One of them is the bowel, he said, because your intestines have villi, which are rapidly reproducing cells, and that means that they are extremely susceptible to radiation. If radiation were ingested, or if the gut were exposed to a large external dose, you would see signs of real damage. You mean like these people are? Is that what you mean? It's important, people. And you know, don't let people who think that they're experts just whitewash everything that happened here and as if it was a non-issue. As if what we were seeing somehow didn't matter to anyone. There, there's your answer to how many people have actually died in Fukushima. The number is still climbing. And while they're still alive, they're miserable. That's what nuclear does for you. And then, okay, so to be clear, I had the question asked on my, uh, my Facebook, my, my uh, YouTube page. So I have uh, addressed it significantly, I think. Uh, the Japan Times. Um, this is a short one. TEPCO tests halting water injection into crippled reactor at Fukushima number one nuclear power plant. The operator of the Fukushima number one nuclear power plant conducted a test Monday, temporarily halting the water being injected into one of the reactors that suffered a core meltdown in the wake of the 2011 accident. Pardon me, dying of thirst. Vitamin water out of the vending machine now. How cool is that? Through the test, which was the first of its kind, and TEPCO Holdings Inc. plans to obtain data on how the temperature inside the number two reactor could rise in the event of an emergency and the use of information to update its planned response. So at 10 a.m. on Monday, TEPCO immediately halted the water injection into the number two, which usually receives around 300 tons of coolant per hour. We already know they're having trouble storing it. <clears throat> they're also worried about what's going to happen should the Pacific continue to show us some of the problems that we have been seeing. So 
again, it is good that they're they're at least looking at this and trying to address the issue, but this is what happens not just when you're foolish enough to build a nuclear power plant, but dumb enough to build one on on the, uh, by the water. You know, we have earthquakes now in Cleveland. Like it's very likely that one would be big enough to create a problem on Lake Erie, but if so, we have a nuclear power plant there right beside an amusement park. All right, guys, Sputnik News, two stories left here, like I said. Sputnik News, what if all nuclear reactors blew up at once? UK scientists have a say. Now, here, and this is why I picked this story out, here is where and how you are being lied to, excuse me, and misled when you're getting nuclear readings or readings about what is safe and what's a safe level and what is it. I'm going to go to screen share here for my Media Speaks people. You can subscribe to the channel on the Media Speaks, of course. If all nuclear power stations on the Earth exploded simultaneously, it would result in the planet becoming uninhabitable over the next 156 years due to the soil and atmosphere being contaminated by the radioactive isotope cesium-137, British scientists have pointed out. Now, that sentence right there made zero sense to me. And then I read a little bit more. And what do they say? Clark claimed that the radiation dropped to safe levels five years after Praefaya. From the model we judge, this is a severe underestimate and conclude the radiation levels would only be sustain, survivable for 156 years, pointing to the main fallout isotopes iodine-131 and cesium-134 and 137. Now, do you know why they test for those? Because those break down half-life, they decay, I should say. Do you know the half-life of uranium and plutonium is millions of years? Look it up. I think one of them is like a billion years or something. Do you know why they don't test for plutonium and uranium? They don't give you those results? Because if they gave you those results, not so much for screen share, if, they, if we gave you those results, they'd have to let you know how bad it really is. When they're only testing for those two, yes, it's bad. Yes, that causes cancer. Yes, it causes the thyroid. But come on now. And if you thought that was the dumdy of the day, it's not. Here we go. There's our dumdy music. Remember, you can donate at the correct views at hotmail.com through PayPal. I'd really appreciate it if you did so, because all money that you give to me does go to a better show. All right, uh, as our you are an idiot music. All right, as it fades away, guys, uh, Dunn's Cap of the Month will be probably next uh, Monday, probably next Monday, for sure the Monday after that, if not, or next week. My schedule's jumping around right now. I have a day job, too. I have, uh, I'm writing, I'm DJing, bringing you this show. We're busy. Earth.com, friends. Um, deep ocean animals are eating radioactive carbon from nuclear bomb tests. Yep. And we just keep on denying that there's some kind of a problem here. And again, this, this is problems with uh, with the nuclear in general. This one here, not even necessarily just from Fukushima. Although Fukushima food keeps ending up on our plates to poison us. This is worthy of noting here. Again, Earth.com. A new study has revealed that even the most remote and deep regions on Earth are not isolated from human activities. According to the research, radioactive carbon leftover from nuclear bomb tests in the 1950s and 60s have made their way to the bottom of the ocean. Now, you have to remember, that's why I do these shows in the order that I do. I, do the, I should say the topics in the order that I do. What did we just say? What did we just learn about plutonium? Some of those elements. When the levels that we have seen at Fukushima, the, you know, we keep hearing the lie, uh, dilution is the solution to radioactive pollution. No, it's not. It'll just sink. 
and be eaten by things that we eat. Even if it's in the bottom of nowhere, I'm not saying we eat everything from the ocean bottom, but it's no secret that many of them, many of the animals we eat are eating things at the bottom and of course working their way up the food chain. Biology 101. Our researchers have discovered that crustaceans that live at the bottom of the ocean are eating radioactive carbon that has passed through the food web. The food web, there's a good way to put it. The American detail, a study detailing the findings was published in the American Geophysical Union's journal Geophysical Research Letters. They took a long time to pick that name. A lot of thought went into it. Although the ocean circulation takes hundreds of years to bring water containing bomb carbon to the deepest trench, the food chain achieves this much faster, said Ming Yang, the lead author of the new study. Again, it comes back to us quicker. And again, 50s and 60s, it's a long time for us. For a radioactive element, it's still a baby. It's ready to poison some more. You know, people. It's tired of just poisoning the you know, marine life. A nuclear bomb test in the 50s and 60s released radiocarbon-14 into the atmosphere. Once nuclear tests ended, the amount of carbon-14 or bomb carbon in the atmosphere dropped, and the carbon left the atmosphere to settle on the ocean's surface. Over time, marine organisms incorporated this carbon into their cells, and researchers observed elevated levels of carbon-14 in marine animals after nuclear bomb testing started. Because carbon-14 is also created naturally when cosmic rays interact with nitrogen in the atmosphere, nearly all living things on Earth have some amounts of radioactive material in their systems. Of course, you can tell by dating it how far it's degenerated or decayed to tell whether it was from the 50s or 60s or not. Um, Samples were collected from the seven miles in the surface. Amphipod specimens, which are crustaceans that scavenge along the deep ocean floor and eat waste of dead organisms, collected in 2017 in Marina Marsau in New Britain, tested positive. And uh, this study, it says, sheds lights on the eating habits and lifespan, whatever, whatever, and the deteriorating lifespan as more and more our nuclear waste is consumed and considered diluted because it hit the ocean. And friends, that's the massive Fukushima update. Uh, Sam IB signing out here. Do me a favor. Do remember to let me know how you like the show. And uh, again, donate at the correct views at hotmail.com through PayPal if you feel so inclined. I'll be back with the uh, Dunce Cap of the Month uh, soon. Bye, guys.